Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to a brand new episode of Kaiju Conversation. I'm your host, Elijah, and joining me is a very special guest today, Mr. Connor Baxter of Invader Design. How are you today, Connor? I'm feeling very miserable because it's snowing, but I'm actually good, thanks. Um, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was oh. snowing earlier. I, I was. I hate the snow. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I'm pretty good, yeah. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Despite all the things that have been happening with like lockdowns in the UK and all that, I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, that that's great to hear. Great to hear. Uh you staying safe during all this, you know? It's been kind of crazy. Yes. Um by staying safe you mean like locked in the house pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah. It was hard to get used to at first, but um yeah, it's just like um whatever now, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is like the second lockdown now, but um Basically, we know the score pretty much at this point. Yeah. So, as as Connor knows, um, but the listeners, unless you read the title, though I think most people do, so I don't know why I'm always like, in case you don't know. But, uh... Well, we don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we are interviewing uh, Connor today to talk about Invader Design. Yes. Now, before we get into everything... Who is Connor? Uh, Connor is me. I'm joking. But anyway. Um, so um, so my name is Connor Baxter. And what I do is I am a freelance 3D artist that likes to uh, sculpt models in ZBrush and then 3D print them into model kits. I guess that's the basic rundown, I guess. I'm also a student animator as well. So there's that to add to the list. Nice. So... What made you decide you wanted to go into design and animating and modeling? Oh, man, we're going to have to go way back at this point. Uh, I hope you're in for a a nice long story about how my obsession of modeling and animation came to be, I guess. I'm ready. (laughs) So um, once upon a time, Connor was a wee lad, and he liked to draw. And basically, at one point, um, he discovered um, a film called King Kong. Right. And of course, King Kong, as you know, is um, famous for its stop motion and special effects. So Connor wanted to be a uh, stop motion animator. I sound weird talking in like the, the third person. Connor did this. <laughs> but, um, no. Um, so originally I wanted to do stop motion animation. Right. And it turns out um, when you try doing stop motion animation, it's very tedious and time consuming. So it's like, yeah, no. Um, which then led to me wanting to be a cartoonist for like, um, so like uh, funny magazines in the UK, I guess. Like we have like um, the Beano or whatever, I guess. Which is a, it's it's basically like a, a very crap comic strip, pretty much. Um, <laughs> that I'm so surprised it's still going to do. Like I wanted to be that, and then at some point I discovered Flash, so I wanted to be a Flash animator, and then I realised that Flash is basically a broken piece of so and so. Which then resulted in me trying to 3D animation, right? Um, yeah, and then which in turn led to 3D sculpting, um, which in turn led to 3D printing, very much. I think I think that's the basic rundown, I guess. Yeah. So, what was your? You said King Kong. What about King Kong made you like? Uh, how was that the definitive film for you? I don't know. It's like it's basically. To me, the original King Kong, even though some people might say it's dated, is a, a perfect film, right? Um, mostly due to um, the special effects, like I mentioned. Um, the stuff that uh, Walter O'Brien and his team did for that film is, like, uh, revolutionary. Like, um, I really like the way that Kong was animated in that film, as well as all mm-hmm. the other creatures. It's hard to explain, because, like, there's something about that crude animation style that's, like, more inspiring than, let's say, like a stop motion film made today I guess where like they try to make it very smooth or whatever but um, I don't know it's like it's very hard to explain because it's just one of those films that leaves an impression you know mm-hmm. outside of King Kong what what would you say your next exposure to kaiju or monster movies was? It's got to be the big G himself Godzilla Godzilla I think is basically the uh, almost the gateway drug to the uh, the tokusatsu genre, really, if you think about it. Unlike some, uh, like, I watched a few videos, like, people saying, oh, they, 
they saw Godzilla versus Megalon when they were like kids or whatever. But uh, in my case, um, my first exposure to Godzilla was technically the the game Destroyer Monsters of the GameCube, right? Um, <laughs> and the story how um, I got that was my dad he bought the game one day for me. I think way to shut shut me up, and that was a big mistake for him. Um, so, um, so that that introduced me to all the uh, the monsters and all that, which then led to me discovering the films, and then it's been affecting my bank account ever since. But um, yeah, honestly, like um, uh, Godzilla, that's when I really started getting into like stuff like monsters and all that, um, which then led to me like. Uh, like discovering other things as well, like um, all the fifties, like B movie monsters, like uh, them, and like Beast of Twenty Thousand Fathoms, Gorgo, and all that. Yeah. So since King Kong uh, inspired you, I think it's pretty obvious that you would say Willis O'Brien inspired you to an extent. Oh yeah, any uh, of the like old masters, I guess, that uh, worked on like these films, like Willis O'Brien, Ray Harryhausen. Um, the works of like uh, Ashiro Honda and Eiji Tsuburaya, you know, that sort of thing. You know, people who like uh, pioneered in the genre. Mm-hmm. Um, so, out of curiosity, um, and you might have already said this, why did you decide to go into modeling instead of special effects? Or do you want to get into special effects? Um, well, you see, because I do 3D modeling, um, like, I have to keep in mind that. Uh, CGI animation is classed as a special effect, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 3D modeling is just like a branch of it. But um, I wouldn't mind getting to special effects. But the reason why I got into modeling is because it's fun. Um, it's fun. It's something I enjoy doing. You know, it's almost like therapeutic as well. Um, like it's very relaxing um, to do uh, models, especially if I'm like designing like uh, like say like a, a Godzilla or like a uh, something like Cthulhu or, uh, you know, because I, I do like trying to uh, basically create models and try and basically make them as uh, accurate as possible. Now, obviously, with uh, if you're trying to make a suit, like say a Godzilla suit, it's never going to be 100% accurate, but um, mm-hmm. you can only do the best you can, really. Yeah. So what what is your most memorable work so far? What what well first what have you done, modeling wise? Modeling wise, um, actually, um, I might as well just start from the beginning. I guess um, originally I started out um, doing models of like game characters, right? Um, mm-hmm. Because it was it was hip at the time, you know. But you know, it's like surprisingly, not a lot of people take interest in like game models um, or models based on game characters. Yeah. As soon as I started doing ka- kaiju, you know, like that's uh, when uh, people started to notice. Because of that, I think my proudest work that I've done so far has either been um, the Gorgo that I did, which I suppose really got people's attention because there isn't a lot of models of Gorgo um, per se, as well as the Graboid. And the Graboid that I did has definitely been a, a big hit with uh, with. Uh, viewers i guess yeah uh, um and it's funny like um the year that i made this graboid here comes the tremor set in the same year as well it's like huh what do you know you get a double whammy you get uh, an invader <laughs> an invader graboid and a tremor set so you had no intention of releasing this around the same time as the set correct i didn't even know it was being made honestly uh, the time that I made the Graboid, um, like a few months later, here comes the, the Arrow Tremor set. Man, it's like, it's like the universe knew it needed to do this. Yep. Uh, <laughs> the planets have aligned, you know, as like, um... <laughs> yeah. So, and which one was your most memorable work? Pro- it's either a Gorgor or the Graboid, I'd, I'd say. Um, that's the ones that have uh, gotten the most attention. Out of curiosity, which do you think has gotten more attention? I, I'd say Graboid, I think. Uh, I think it's there's something about Graboids that has like a major cult status in the West, I think. Unlike like, Gorgo, which is a bit more obscure, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I 
think the other one that has gotten a lot of attention is the recent Godzilla that I've done, uh, which was the uh, the one based on Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, where he rips out uh, Hedra's eyes and is carrying them in both hands, you know. And, mm-hmm. like, I had many people commenting saying that he's got two basketballs in his hands. Well, you know, you never know. I might make a, a, a Barkley Godzilla. You never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All I do is give him Nike shoes and uh, pink goggles and we're, uh, we're golden. I mean, I'd buy that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so, out of curiosity, how do you come up with what you're going to make? Um, it depends, really. Sometimes I'm just bored. Sometimes I just... I'll see something, like, I'll see, like, uh, I'll watch a movie, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to make it that day, make that one, like, um, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, sure, Um, I haven't made a Creature from the Black Lagoon, but it's on the list. Um, Sometimes, if it's an original sculpt, I, usually, an original sculpt is by accident, usually. Um, Like, I'll just be, like, scribbling out ideas, you know, like, like a notepad or something, and then just like, oh, I could probably make that into a sculpt. What is the process when you decide what you want to make a model or sculpt of? Like, what do you do? Well, the process is, um, so the way that the program ZBrush works is, um, it's like working with modeling clay, right, in a virtual space. Generally, if I'm working on something, I like to block things out first and get the general shape. Um, so, like, I'll, like, maybe get, like, a few cylinders and then smooth them out and then just make a basic shape. And then just slowly refine the model as it goes on. And depending on the details in the model, like sometimes it can take a day, sometimes it can take a week, sometimes it can take a few months. It just depends. Interesting. So out of curiosity, prior to Invader Design, before you established this name, were you making models like how you do now? Or was that was when you made Inv- Invader Design really when you started to do that? Yeah, roughly around the time I made the Invader Design name, yeah, I started making models properly. Like, I had made 3D models in the past, uh, but there was a, a period where I just lost interest. And mm-hmm. then at some point, I think around maybe 2015, I think, maybe, might, might be wrong, um, I started getting back into actually making uh, models. And that's when I came up, I think that's when I came up with Invader Design. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But um, you know, it's it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember the war. But, you know. So, how did you come up with the name Invader Design? I like Space Invaders. I, I just I like the game Space Invaders. I'm like, oh yeah, Invader Design. There you go. Hmm. <laughs> it's like it's it's like it's literally just like taking the name of a hat. It's pretty much you know. No, I didn't really have much thought into coming up with real design, but it sticks. It's memorable enough, you know, so there was that. Yeah. So, okay. Um, have you ever thought about changing it, or is this, like, are you dead set on Invader Design is the name you want to put with your name? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm dead set with it. Yeah. Um... I think it's uh, it's memorable. It's simple, you know, and it uh, sort of gives you a clue of what sort of stuff I make. I guess it's like, ooh, it's like uh, sci-fi or something, you know. But uh, yeah, it's like, uh, what does he design? You know, you know, it gets people curious. Um, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, out of curiosity, what is the process when designing and modeling? Like, once you come up with that idea. How do you go into the your uh, into the uh, what, what 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 is it called the uh, um, ZBrush? Um, yeah, what, when you go into ZBrush, how do you model? Like what what is there to do to make these amazing designs? Um, I might have briefly explained it, uh, but like I said, uh, ZBrush is like modeling clay, so. It's literally I'm making shapes and then smoothing them out into like uh, more shapes or whatever. I guess it's sort of like how they make God's old Godzilla suits. Like if you look at behind the scenes of like like old pictures of a Godzilla, um, obviously they cut the suits up into bits, you know, 
and just stick, stick them together for the most part and just refine it with like adding extra details. Um, I think that's the best way I can explain it. You know. Now, in a lot of your designs, and honestly, I think most of them, uh, if not all of them, are very accurate. How do you get that accuracy? Um, I don't. I just eyeball it for the most part. Um, I try to get it as accurate as possible. I look at various uh, reference images, but I think that's the thing at the end of the day is that, let's say it's a puppet, it's never going to be 100% accurate, but as long as it looks like the, the thing you're trying to make, that's all that matters. Like, sometimes, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, if I can't see a detail, I'll just try and improvise it. Like, I made a Kraken model not long ago based on Clash of Titans, right? And I could not find... Right, here's the problem with the Kraken, is that they made two puppets for that film, right? They made the close-up shot puppet, and they made the uh, wide shot puppet, I guess, right? And the Kraken I based on was the wide shot puppet, right? And I could not find good images of the Kraken's back, right? Yeah. I know the Kraken has, like, spines going down his back, but I don't know how many spines he has. So what I ended up doing was I had to make a compromise, and I looked at the, the poster art for Clash of the Titans and thought, you know, sure, we'll, we'll just uh, we'll give them the, the amount of spines on the poster. You know, so I think it still looks pretty good, I think. Um, you know, you now, the actual puppet might not have that detail. Mm -hmm. I actually recently found out that there is a poster that has the spines on the back. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's the Japanese one, right? Um, well, you know, if you have to keep in mind, sometimes posters have been copied, but I, I'm sure the one that I copied was an American poster. Because they did, they did two posters for Clash of the Titans. They did uh, the uh, one with Perseus on Pegasus, and you got the the Kraken and all that. And there's another one was, which has Medusa in the background, which I think was the European poster. All right. Hmm. Well, um, out of curiosity, so obviously Will O'Brien uh, was an inspiration, mm -hmm. but uh, recently, you know, we just talked about the Kraken from the Clash of the Titans. What would you say Ray Harryhausen has done to inspire you, if at all? I think it's mostly his creature designs. Right. Because um, I am not a fan of overly complicated designs. Like, mm -hmm. I firmly believe it's sometimes the most simple designs look the best. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, let's just say... I'm indifferent with the Cloverfield Monsters design for uh, reasons. I think the design um, is too much, right? Uh, they try to make the creature look realistic, and I think it fails, I think. Uh, whilst you look at the, let's say, the Cyclops from the Seven Boys of Sinbad, you know, it's like, it's a basic design, but it's memorable, you know, it's simple. Same goes with like other things like graboids. You know, graboids is like a worm, a giant worm, and you know, or Godzilla. It's a dinosaur of like uh, Stegosaurus, uh, like spines. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's what I like about uh, Ray Harris and like his designs are simple, but um, they leave a lasting impact. Now, out of curiosity, so you kind of touched on this. What is your opinion on realistic designs for monsters? I, I know right now the monster verse is a very popular topic. Do you like it when they make them more quote unquote realistic, or do you like the more fantastic designs that are not based on science? See, I like them both, right? But I think it's more like when they overcomplicate things when there's like too much. Mm -hmm. Um or if the design just seems unappealing, appealing, if that makes sense. Like, some CG aliens, I guess, um, which I suppose is the same problem as the Cloverfield monster. They're like, oh, well, we'll make them, like, I don't know, have, like, moving parts on their face or something, or, like, uh, moving parts of their skin or something. Or, like, um, we'll give them, like, 10,000 eyeballs or something. It's like, there comes a point when it's too much. Yeah. Whilst, what I think the monsterverse gets right is it keeps the design simple. 
Godzilla is pretty much like I said, he's a dinosaur. Ghidorah's literally afraid of the dragon. Mothra's a giant moth, etc. You know. Yeah. And even though some of the original kaiju that came up with, like Behemoth, who's basically like a mammoth, pretty much, um, without a snow. Now, out of curiosity, when you say simple, um, I don't think you're referring to it's very basic, because there's a lot of detail. So when you say simple, what exactly are you referring to? Are you referring to, like, the outline, or what is it? Yeah, I suppose um, it's a few things, but... Basically, what it is in concept, like I said, Godzilla's a dinosaur. This is more to do with like character design as well. Like, what makes a good character design? Like, um, if I can recognize what that is uh, through a silhouette as well, um, then that makes a good character design. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you could do like Ray Harryhausen's models um, or any of the Godzilla suits. If, um, if you uh, put them through silhouette and they're easily recognizable, then it's a good design. Something like the Cloverfield monster, you know, or like, uh, I'm trying to think of another example of like a horrible looking design. Um, can't think of anyone, anyone just now, but um, no, I just don't think it works. Mm -hmm. um, even something like Stranger Things as well with the, the Demogorgon, you know, that's another example of a, of a, a simple uh, design um, done right, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's literally like a humanoid. But it's like a, a mouth that opens up, you know? Yeah. So, um, we've kind of talked about here simple designs. What would make a good complex design, and what would make a bad complex design? Um, okay, so, that's a tough one, actually. Um, so, a, a good complex design is something that's memorable for a start can be easily drawn, I guess, right? If that makes sense. Like, it, something that's... I think a good example would be Transformers, right? Mm -hmm. For, like, a, a good complex design, right? You can still recognize the Transformers by their silhouettes, right? Like, you can tell who's Optimus Prime, who's Bumblebee, or whatever. But I like how they, like, uh, add the little mechanical details, like the cogs moving and all that. Mm -hmm. Um... But that being said, now that I mentioned uh, good Transformers designs, then we get to like something like Megatron, <laughs> or, you know, um, or like uh, where basically it's just uh, too too much, like uh, too much bits in the design, like uh, like little details, you know, for it becomes like I don't even know what I'm looking at. Yeah, like it's literally there's bits of metal just stuck to each other or something like that. The same goes with any other type of character design, you know. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's any kaiju that you know of where they have this problem of a over-complex design? Hmm. Any kaiju? Not um, at all my head, no. All right. Um, okay, so the, you've got those two. Is there a good median when it comes to simplicity and complex? Like, is there a middle ground that is good, or is that middle ground kind of bad? In terms of designs, um, I suppose a, a good middle ground was is um, you um, something like Cthulhu, I guess, right? Um, Cthulhu is a good middle ground because um, you can like every artist's interpretation of Cthulhu is, is different, right? Mm -hmm. But they always keep the same sort of like basic design choices. They can make them look as simple as possible, and they can make them look as horrible and disgusting as possible. But as long as he has the, the the same features that is pretty much in every interpretation, then it can make for a good design, I guess. Really, just don't don't overdo designs. Really, you know, mm -hmm. just don't uh, go too far where it's no longer appealing to look at. Like. Um, Sort of like if, um, let's say, Cthulhu has scales, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they decided, okay, we're going to also make the, the scales have tiny hairs or something like that. Something disgusting like that. Yeah. It's, like, uh, it's, it's like it becomes too much, I think. Yeah. yeah. Going back to, since we've kind of talked about what makes a good and bad design, how's been the reception of all of your 
um, models and designs you've made, have people typically like them? What 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 kind of reception have you gotten so far? I think um, yeah, the the reception is mostly been positive, right? Um, I haven't had any bad comments so far. I th I, I usually let to the uh, the audience with the judge when it comes to my models, like because I'm very self critical, you know, of how they come out. Mm -hmm. Like I I generally do not like my own models. If the audience says the models are good, models are good, and they say it doesn't look right, then it's bad, pretty much. And I basically look at my work and say, okay, how can I improve and all that, you know. I'm basically my uh, harshest critic, pretty much. But yeah. generally speaking, so far, the reception has been positive. Good. Uh, I know personally, I, I love what you've done. So has there been any design or model that you've been like, you know, that's pretty good. I suppose the uh, the Graboid I did, only because uh, once that thing got printed out, and it's like, oh man. Because here's the thing as well, it's like, even though I know how big these things are going to be when they print out, it always amazes me, um, if that makes sense. It always catches me off guard, like, oh, it's, oh, it's actually bigger than I thought it, looked, thought it would be, or something like that, or it, it's like massive. Um, but the Graboid I'm extremely proud of, because not only could you technically display it as is, you can hang it on your wall as well. Um, you know, like, uh, I designed it so that uh, you could actually pin it on your wall. Pull a Burt Gummer? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, out of curiosity, have there been any difficulties when modeling and printing off? Uh, is there any difficulties that come with that, or is it a pretty simple process? So making the models is simple. Printing is a different story altogether. Because here's the misconception people have, right? A lot of people think, uh, oh, we'll, we'll just press print, and it'll we'll just print as normal. No, 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 no. Nine times out of ten, prints will fail. Unfortunately, that is just something you have to deal with with 3D printing. You know, it could be the supports on the model are not right when you're pr printing, which is basically the scaffolding that's on the print. The nozzle might be um, worn out, so you need to replace that. The uh, extruder might be broken, so you need to replace that. You know, you might run out of plastic, so you have to get more plastic. You know, it's just like an endless... Uh, it's an investment, let's just say that. Mm -hmm. Now, how many printers do you have for all of them? Is it just one, or do you, do you have a few or two or something? Just one. Just one currently. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple printer, really. It's... Uh, and any cubic mega s, which is like like a cheap Chinese uh, printer, like um, it does the job. I'd say, yeah. But I have thought about maybe extending, basically getting a new printer. I guess so. It's basically twice the work. Yeah. I also consider maybe resin printers as well for like um, smaller figures. I guess because um, I like to expand my uh, sort of horizons when it comes to uh, making models. You know, like. Yeah. Generally, generally speaking, I usually print my models from like six inches to about twelve inches tall. Um, but I wouldn't mind trying an experiment with like tiny, tinier models, like maybe in the three-inch range. So I like those uh, those games workshop uh, figures. Mm -hmm. Now, out of curiosity, what is easier slash better to design and print out? Is it smaller or bigger designs? Um. I'd probably say bigger because um, you get more detail, I guess, because um, the nozzle on the printer is only a certain size, right? And basically, the smaller you get, the harder time it has to print, you know. And sometimes you get some interesting results, let's just say. Um, it might involve swearing at the printer when it uh, messes up, but uh, <laughs> yeah, generally, I do prefer making bigger prints because usually they usually turn out all right. All right. And so you mentioned that there's a ton of issues with printing. Uh, is there different ways to print? Or is it just one way or you're screwed? Um, pretty much just one way, really. Um, so my printer is an FDM printer. And what an FDM printer is is basically a nozzle with um, a spool of plastic attached to it. And it prints it off layer by layer, right? Um, that's really the only way you can print it with that type of printer, right? The only way you could probably maybe change the print is maybe have the prints print at an angle, because sometimes that can be a better result. But apart from that, you know, you're just stuck with what you've got. Yeah. Um, now, it, 
It's plastic, but can you print with other materials, or is it just simply plastic? It has to be FDM plastic, otherwise um, you'll break your printer. But <laughs> um, well, printers as well, some printers... So, I use PLA plastic, right, which mm -hmm. is a biodegradable plastic. It's also non-toxic, as far as I'm aware. I don't know, maybe I might be dead tomorrow, but we'll see. But, um... <laughs> but, um... Generally speaking, it's a uh, it's a non toxic plastic that's biodegradable. Um, well, it's biodegradable if you bury it in the garden. Um, but um, yeah, some printers you can get different materials, but my printer just does ABS or PLA. Yeah. Okay. Now, personally, whenever I think of three D models printed off, I think of these still um, kind of flimsy. Uh, prints. Is that just a stereotype, or uh, is that accurate? Like, uh, are the prints uh, f flimsy? Um, like, like how high quality the prints are. are. They can they be actually good, or are they typically kind of hard to handle and you know deal with? Um, so generally, when you three D print things, the, the models are hollow. Right, they're quite sturdy because usually the the outer uh, wall or the inner wall when it's prints uh, is usually quite thick. So if you drop these things, they're not going to break unless you really are desperate to break it. You know. So usually they'll just bounce, I guess. All right. Now, can you make so? Can you print off three D models that move, or do they have to stay in one place? Um. What do you mean, like articulated figures? Yes, yes. Okay, um, I technically could, but um, currently the uh, FDM printer that I'm using is not suitable because the plastic would be too brittle in that case because it would be smaller parts. So if I, say, wanted to print off a, a six-inch figure of, of something, um, while it will print, um, the plastic isn't strong enough to, like, uh, it, it wears down very quickly over time. Um, which is uh, why I prefer just printing off like static models for the most part. I gotcha. Yeah, so um, if it was maybe like a resin printer, usually those parts are more solid, I guess, and are less prone to breaking, but um, who knows? I'll probably have to invest in one in the future. Now, out of curiosity, if a person was getting into printing, would you recommend the printer you use now, or would you say they should save up a little bit more and get something higher uh, priced? I don't know, because there's, like, uh, there's different uh, printer brands. You know, The brand that I use is just one brand, but there's like other brands they can pick from. There's like uh, Creality printers, there's End of Freeze, and so on and so forth. But yeah, I suppose, um, I suppose my printer would be a good entry-level printer, I guess, if they want to, you know, get into like uh sort of like professional grade printing i guess mm -hmm. um there's also like cheaper alternatives like you've got like flash force printers which while they do uh work very well from what i've experienced um they don't last long like they maybe might last maybe like a couple years at least before they like the snuff it and plus um it's like uh, to use those printers as well you need to use their own software you can't use like third party software Ah, all right. Um, now, out of curiosity, um, you mentioned earlier that there was scaffolding for the prints. Is there anything you just, like, physically cannot print off? Uh, basically overhangs, pretty much. So let's say um, I wanted to print a figure, and he's got his arm sticking out, right? Mm -hmm. um, when the printer is printing layer by layer, there's nothing... Um, for those arms to like uh, balance on, so the when you uh, finish your print, you just got a whole bunch of spaghetti, pretty much. You know, that's why we use scaffolding, pretty much. It just it just makes sure it makes sure that um, your print uh, comes out nice. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there's still a lot of cleanup, you know, but that's just uh, part of the whole three D printing experience. What is the cleanup? Um, basically, cutting off flash. Um, or like tags when you do a 3d print it's never going to be perfect right when you take it straight off the printer right it's going to look ugly as, as hell right so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to clean it up so 
usually there'll be some minor bits of flash from the scaffolding that you need to cut off with a knife. There might be some bits that didn't print properly, so you'll need to get like filler or some kind to fill up those gaps. Although, um, with some customers that I've had, I do offer to fill up the gaps for them, but if they're experienced modders, usually a lot of the time they're willing just to fill up the gaps themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you've got to like sand and all that, you know, just basically just to a point where it doesn't look like garbage. Yeah. Now, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, making it look nice, refine refining it. What about paint? Can you use any paint on plastic, or does it have to be like a specific type? Technically speaking, you can paint a model however you want. Right. I prefer using um, inks, for example, something unconventional. Um, I also, I genuinely don't buy, um, with the exception of enamel paints, I usually don't buy. Model, model paints for the mm. most part um, because they're just practically just the same stuff pretty much you know um, it's just like the normal sort of like paint you can get that um, being said as well um, I also like to use like paint from like auto shops or car shops I guess it's generally cheaper I guess to like uh, get to like car paint um, but you basically just get the same result Interesting, interesting. So, for anybody that wants to get into designing or modeling or printing off 3D prints or even painting, what advice would you give them? Like everything, it, uh, it's like you need to learn the sort of thing. Um, practice makes perfect. It's taken me years to like properly learn how to use like ZBrush and all that, how to like sculpt with it, you know. And the thing with ZBrush as well, ZBrush is a, uh, it's a learning, a learning curve, right? And some people get put off by it when they, as soon as they boot off, boot off from what I've noticed. Give it time, you, and you can create great things, I guess. You know, and if they want to get into three D printing as well, like just, just know that there will be curveballs along the way, and that uh, not every printer will be perfect, but eventually you will uh, get a uh, a good print. All right. Um, and would you recommend any classes? Is there any classes people could take to help themselves, or is this just one of those things that you learn as you uh, to go on your journey? Yeah, I'm sure with like ZBrush, there's like um, online courses, but generally I am uh, self-taught for the most part. You know, when it comes to ZBrush, same goes with 3D printing. Like you can pretty much find all the resources online to learn how to do these sort of things. Like, whether it be YouTube or like a uh, like a, a classroom or something. But generally, it's... Um, you don't... I don't believe that you need to, like, get any other experience in that. You know, it's like... You go to employers, right, and you're showing, like, your 3D models and all that. But, um, they're not interested in qualifications. They're interested in your work. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, Invader, would you say... There was so you mentioned how uh, you drew, you drew as a kid, and you know you kept practicing and you kept practicing. Was there anything outside of that that really helped you, or was it just simply that and you kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and you learned to uh, just you naturally grew into the craft. Um, yeah, pretty much, yeah, just, uh, drew and drew and drew, you know, and, uh, same with modeling, you know, like, um, when I started modeling in, uh, digitally for the first time, like, I had a hard time of it, but eventually, you know, I suppose got good, I guess, according to most people, but, um, yeah, it's, like I said, it, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, now, we're gonna kind of take a shift here, so we've been talking about what you've done, how you got into this, now, I'm at very curious, do you plan on, in the future, doing original designs? Oh, yeah. Um, I have teased um, before some various projects I've uh, thought about doing. Uh, one called uh, HodgePodge Monsters, um, which is uh, something I've planned for a while, um, or thought about doing for a while. 
I'm not going to spoil what it is, so you're just going to find out yourself. Um, <laughs> yep. Best fair. Uh, I feel like if you make stuff people recognize first, that's how you grab an audience, and then you can start uh, churning out your own designs, I think. Because at that point, I think people will kind of respect you enough you know, that they'd actually care to look at your designs. Yeah. And another thing, will you, because I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but can you use the models you make in games? Yes, technically, uh, yeah, you can, but there's another step to it. Um, it's one thing sculpting it, right? But uh, it's another thing trying to make it animation ready. So you have to do stuff like retopology and all that, which is basically the uh, terminology used to basically make stuff low poly, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to do texturing, which is a whole separate thing. You know, like in animation, like um, a lot of the time, this is like separate departments, right? That do these things. So you might have one guy uh, doing models, another guy doing textures, another guy doing, uh, you know, retopology and such, another guy doing animation. It's not just as easy as, uh, I've just made a model, this game is going to crash now. Yeah. Now, do you plan or do you, would you be open to do video game designs in the future? Or do you kind of like where you're at? Um... Yeah, why not? I guess you know, like I, I wouldn't mind doing uh, more video game designs. I guess um, I wouldn't mind working on games as well. You know, because well, I'm an animator. I guess well, not an animator, a student animator. But um, yeah, I wouldn't mind. Um, um, the way that I see it is, um, it's best not to put uh, all your eggs in one basket when it comes to like the animation or the game industry because you never know what job you're going to get to start with. Mm -hmm. You know, it might evolve into something else. Yeah, Th that's a great note. Um, it's actually a great note to end on, I think, for um, asking most of the questions. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think the big question here is, do you do commissions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think the, a good follow-up question is, where can people send you commissions? So um, for private commissions, you can uh, contact me at realinvadivedesign at gmail.com or um, you can contact me via Twitter at invader underscore design. That's your best uh, way of getting in contact with me. Now, do you have any... What, do you have a rough estimate? Because it's obviously it's going to be different per uh, commission, but is there any like outline you could give to let people know, okay, this is what I charge, or this is how I charge, just so people can, can you know, know that before going in. So when it comes to pricing, like this really depends on like the size of the model, how long it'll take to make, how long it'll take to print, how much electricity to use. I have to consider maintenance for the printer and all that. You know, it's like, you know, and I've also got to consider postage as well. So it's like all those factors sort of add up to the overall cost, I guess. You know. Yeah. Uh, so it really depends. Like, I don't have like a set price per se, but uh, like, if it's a simple mod model, then obviously the price will be lower. But um, if it's something like complex, like, I don't know, say someone wanted uh, a full-size Loch Ness monster, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, obviously that would be, uh, that would probably be a very expensive figure. Yeah. All right. Um, and is there any other way to contact you or any other social media or anything you want to promote? Um, just let people know where can they find you and what can they what can they expect to enjoy from the Invader design? Well, like I said, um, you can follow me on Twitter, right? And you can send me a message on there where I, I usually post, uh, for the most part, daily, I guess. Um if you want another alter way you can contact me is you can go on my portfolio site, which is invadedesign.co.uk, where it has examples of my print work, my modeling work, and my painting work for models. As well as it's, um, you can also follow me on Instagram as well, which is um, Invader Design. Very much. That's my username on that. You know, <laughs> pretty simple. Pretty simple to remember. You know, <laughs> I think. Uh, Apart from that, that's pretty much how you can follow my work. 
All right. And for anybody listening, you should totally check them out. And all of that will be down in the description of this episode. The website, his Instagram, his Twitter, all of it will be down below. So please check that out. Give him a follow if you can. I know it's money's a little tight right now, but if you can commission him, definitely commission him. Uh, I plan on uh, commissioning him for a Yongari figure, whatever. I don't know how big it'll be yet. I still haven't figured out what I what I want yet, but I definitely recommend um, checking out everything he's done. Well, ev- everything is possible for a price. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, if you're interested in a younger, I can easily do one for you. Um, I I will definitely keep that in mind for uh, future investments, and mm-hmm. when I and uh, I will definitely have to whenever I I do that, I'll have to make sure and tweet it out and get it out there that the one and only Invader Design is where to go for all your kaiju design needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you Connor so much for um, I I know this has been one of the things that we've been talking about doing for for a few months now and I appreciate uh, you coming on today and finally uh, getting this in I've been wanting to do this for a while and it's it's really nice to finally get to do this Um, I know I learned a bit um, and I hope some other people learn uh, a bit about modeling and whatnot. So maybe they might want to get into it, or they may even want to reach out and see how much they could get a commission for. Mm-hmm. And who knows? Um, maybe one of these big companies might be like, hey, this guy's good. Yeah. <clears throat> X plus. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I have to just make this clear just because I know you love it when people ask this question. Can I get a free design? Thank you for listening to Kaiju Conversation, <laughs> folks. Uh, so, the story to be learned is don't ask for free commissions. Yeah, because basically that sets a precedent. Doing private commissions is pretty much um, a job, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. And if I end up doing free commissions, basically, um, I will never basically get paid for work, pretty much. You know, and that's a lot of hours put into stuff. Like I said before, I could take weeks and months to make a, a model. Now, is there any last final statements or anything you'd like to add on? This is the time for you to answer who your favorite kaiju podcaster is. Um, you know, all that good stuff. Um, okay, sure. My favorite um, kaiju podcaster is uh, obviously Gargantucast. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> um I like all kaiju podcasters uh, equally. <laughs> I see, I see. Okay. My closing statement is, if you're interested in a 3D commission, uh, I would like a, a 3D model. I'm always open for private commissions. And like I said before, you can contact me at uh, realinvadedesign at gmail.com or direct message me on Twitter at uh, tw- uh, Twitter. Uh, uh, bleh, I messed that up completely. Um, <laughs> That's Invader on the design, okay? Goodbye. <laughs> uh, and uh, and as I said before, that'll all be down in the description below. Check it out. As for me, hi, I'm Elijah. I've been the person asking Connor uh, these questions and trying to get people to realize that he is the go-to guy for Kaiju Designs. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at et13 productions uh, or at e thomas 1975. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram at et13 productions or you can uh, subscribe to me on YouTube at et13 productions. 
all pretty straightforward. Um, don't forget to rate us on iTunes, uh, the podcast that is. Uh, that boosts our ratings and helps us get recommended to more people just like you. And maybe that could get more people in the know about Invader Design and how awesome he is with his work. If you don't have an Apple device, which I don't blame you, I don't, you can always tweet us and follow us on Twitter at K-A-I-J-U underscore C-O-N-V-E-R-S. If you don't have either of those, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram and contact us through those means. If you're like me before podcasting and you don't have any social media, you can email us at kaijuconversation at gmail.com. All lowercase, all one word, you know the drill. And as always, we'll, rev- we'll read your reviews on air for everybody to hear. We also have merchandise on Teespring. Again, as I keep saying every week, it's not... I'm going to have original art up eventually. It's just I, I gotta I gotta get off my butt and stop being lazy and actually do it. Um, and if you'd like to chat with me or anybody uh, about kaiju or tokusatsu, you can always join our Discord server where we chat about all this stuff. We also have podcasts uh, that will start up monthly where we'll, we'll have a few people from the server hop in calls and record. We're even recording right now on the server as this is the central hub for pretty much everything Kaiju Conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell so you can be notified anytime we upload. I haven't uploaded in like two months. Again, I need to stop being lazy. I know, I'm lazy. I need to stop being lazy. And a huge thanks to our editor, Rex, for editing all of these episodes. All of his links can be found in the description below. As with everything that I've listed, that can all be found in the description below, so please check that out. Thank you, Connor, for being on. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Um, and maybe in the future we can have you on to talk about King Kong or maybe a Ray Harryhausen film or something. I think that might be a little fun. Mm-hmm. I so, think so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might actually have something for you. Uh, we'll have to talk about that later. So thank oh. you guys so much for listening. And please remember, life's too short to not talk big. Bye, guys.